Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Scurf Interviews video podcast. Uh, I'm excited for the conversation that we're having, uh, exploring the intersection of culture and compensation with our guests, Professor Ellie Rennie from RMIT and Zach Anderson from Coordinate. And so before we get into the actual conversation, I'll pass it off to each of the guests to introduce themselves. So Ellie, do you mind just quickly uh, giving an introduction? Yeah, sure. So I'm a professor at RMIT University in the Blockchain Innovation Hub. I do a type of research called digital ethnography, which means I try to get inside online communities to understand how they work. And together with some other folk at uh, GovBase, which some of you may have heard of, we've been designing tools that enable us to work with participants inside Discord servers to try to understand blockchain governance, but also some of these issues around work and compensation better. And the community that we've been piloting these methods with happens to be SourceCred, which is one of the first and uh, probably most elaborate systems there is for trying to compensate uh, people uh, using an algorithm. Um, and that code base is used within a number of different blockchain communities. Great. Thank you, Ellie. Zach, do you mind jumping in with a quick intro? Sure. I am indeed Zach. I am a, a core contributor at Coordinate, uh, also a contributor at Yearn, um, and of course, like any good web person, like 10 other DAOs that I'm very excited about and um, distract myself with. Uh, so, but, but primarily my focus is on Coordinate, and Coordinate is a, a platform for DAOs to allocate resources to uh, contributors around that are um, doing various work that adds value. So Coordinate is a, a system where we're decentralizing decisions around compensation um, so that people pay each other based on their perceived value that others are adding. Great. Thank you both for providing that background. And to jump into the conversation and sort of building on what both of you were alluding to in terms of your experience and, and affiliations, I just wonder what you see as uh, interesting or sort of sitting at this intersection of culture and compensation and what you see as the, the related matters when you think of that area. I'm happy to go first on that one. Uh, and I'll quote something that I heard within a, within a source cred meeting, in fact, where someone pointed out that once you leave your workplace at a regular organization, you, you may have built up all these friendships, but you leave and then they just become LinkedIn connections. <laughs> and for me, that really resonated as, you know, the difference that we're seeing in these decentralized organizations and the kinds of work that occurs there as being maybe, maybe work-like and similar, but also has all these other cultural dynamics. And also people are not there on some kind of payroll necessarily or uh, with, um, I suppose, many of the typical workplace codes in place. So how do we ensure that the work that's being done, which is often otherwise voluntary, gets rewarded? But also, how do you break some of those uh, formalities and, oh, well, I suppose just strict boundaries that current workplaces impose and make them more about uh, the community and the collaboration that occurs? But I'm going to hand over to Zach because I'm, I'm particularly curious to hear more about Coordinate's exact model and how you came up with it. Well, sure. I mean, I, I can start there because it sort of leads to this, this question about compensation and culture. Um, Coordinate has its roots in, in lots of different things and ideas, both um, you know, Tracheopteryx and, and Zem, who are co-founders with me, brought a lot of their experience, a lot of what we learned at Yearn. Um, and, and one of the other things is that it was rooted in um, my old company that um, I co-founded with some friends called Converge. And Converge is a consultancy helping basically environmental and social impact networks. So people to collaborate around systemic issues. Uh, and at Converge, we were sort of like a, a prototypical IRL DAO um, without knowing it. Our focus is on networks, so that's what we 
that was the language we used, but Converge has never had any employees or payroll. Um, and the process we used for paying each other was we affectionately kind of called Thunderdome um, as a joke, thinking it was going to be like everyone, you know, trying to get the most for themselves. Uh, it turned out to be much the opposite, actually, that people were, if anything, trying to reward um, their friends and peers more. But we would do a project and say we invoice some amount of money and we would put it in the middle of the you know, proverbial or actual literal table and say like, okay, there's you know, $35,000 here for this X months of work. Like, how much did you get? What do you think you earned? Um, how much do you think I should get, right? And it would be a conversation until everybody, like the conversation is over when everyone says like, okay, I feel good about this. Um, and so, and, and that's how we have run Converge for the past eight years. Coordinate is essentially that same process, but trying to take it into the decentralized um, asynchronous space of DAOs and saying, instead of one person or some small group of people using their subjective ideas and standards about who should be paid what, let's ask the community itself, um, push the decision making to the edges and ask people where they've seen value be created. And I think this is a really important cultural element of, of Web3 um, because it really, one, it creates a, a different mindset around gratitude and generosity. Um, the fact that you're, you're literally thanking people. You know, the token in, in Coordinate is called give, and you're giving people things and sending them notes and saying, hey, here's what you did and here's why I appreciate it. Um, and that turns into money. That's a lot different than, than getting a paycheck. Um, the other reason it's different is that it, it really pushes more sovereignty onto, onto people, you know, and instead of in a traditional organization where I'm essentially, it's just me versus the company, right? And, and my job is sort of to see how much I can get uh, in compensation from this company. In a DAO, we're all owners of it, right? So I'm, I'm the steward of the collective resources um, as well as for myself. And so it, it structurally creates more of a self-interest, shared interest dynamic than a lot, of, a lot of companies who, you know, for the most part, um, especially these larger organizations, are kind of going to go on whether you're involved or not. Um, and so those are, those are two ways that culture changes. I'm really interested to hear how that plays out in terms of because it's a giving model, does it become a popularity contest or are people more inclined to reward everyone or do you, does everyone in the end feel that there's a, a fair balance that results from that method? I would say all of the above. You know, there's, there's over 400 circles running now on Coordinate. So, um, you know, we definitely see all those kind of use cases. I think this, this goes back to, again, like what I think is the most important cultural piece um, of Coordinate and what it, the potential that it does allow is, you know, we always say that, that uh, in, in Coordinate, the results of each distribution are, are transparent and clear. So you can see there's a graph that shows each person and how, not exactly how much, but you can see who gave to who and who received from who. Um, and we always say that, that the conversations that can come out of the allocation is much more valuable than the allocation itself. And, you know, one of the things that, that we've learned um, you know, and this has been true for, for decades in management science, like what are, what are the characteristics of high-performing teams? You know, it's psychological safety and equal contribution. And so how do we use these sort of dynamics to create that kind of psychological safety? So there will certainly be people who give, you know, a little bit to everyone in the circle, hoping they'll create some sort of like oh, well, they gave to me, so I guess I should give to them, right? There'll be either conscious or a lot of times subconscious gaming of things. Um, there will be someone who posts in Discord all the time about the things they're doing, and people may have the perception that they're contributing a lot, while if someone else is not on Discord at all because they're busy writing code. They're actually you know, doing so much more. Um, but the hope is that over time, you know, those dynamics are going to be present anyway, and this can help surface them. And now we're actually having a conversation about, well, what do we actually think is valuable? You know, this person got the most give, 
for, you know, for what exactly? And someone can put their hands up and be like, look, I shipped, you know, 10 GitHub repos last week and I only got this much. So, um, you know, there, th those kind of things will happen and they can make the team stronger because they're seeing these dynamics play out. Um, and I can also say that, uh, I, I can also say that, that, you know, we have many, many examples of teams saying this is, you know, about the same distribution that we thought it would be, or this seems right. And, and the difference is, is that pe everyone is way more satisfied with the outcome because they all participated in it. They all understand how it came to be, their voice is heard. Um, and so, you know, a lot of distributions would land about where people think, but their satisfaction is higher than if it came down from some committee, you know, um, who has kind of a black box process of like, how did you decide who gets what? Uh, so one of the theories that I've picked up, picked up on within SourceCred is similar to that, which, and it was, I think it was expressed in a, a video of the founder Dandelion talking at a Web3 summit, where they say that um, the, the security of source cred comes through community and through community moderation. So even though their algorithm is derived from Google's PageRank algorithm uh, and, and Google creates security through obscurity, in source cred it's through visibility and through attention. And that's what I find most fascinating about these DAO tools that are being used now, both, both these two examples in particular, is it's showing how decentralization can create, I suppose you could call it security or some kind of just robustness or resilience or something like that through the dynamics of the group. And in fact, what these tools possibly, and this is just a theory for me, only work in stronger communities. What do you think about that? I, I don't know. Um, I, I think they, they definitely work. They, we know they work well in, in higher trust communities and situations. Um, almost everything works better in higher trust communities. Um, you know, trust is actually like the most important um, ingredient for successful collaboration. That's well, well documented. Um, and so, you know, I, I think though that, that actually We've seen, at least in some preliminary, you know, Bankless has run circles with more than 200 people um, run coordinate circles. And I, I think what it, what it lacks, obviously, you know, there's very few people that almost no one knows what everybody's been doing. Um, but as long as it's, it's fundamentally anyway, whether it's a four-person, you know, committee distributing resources or whether it's the whole community, um, there's still going to be some allocation. And I think that, that having an active part in that um, definitely makes people more trusting of the outcomes. It definitely pe makes people more engaged in, in thinking through and understanding things instead of just like, um, you know, writing a grant and if they get it, great, but like, why? You know, <laughs> um, how do these decision making happen? And, and that's hard to document. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's certainly Dunbar, you know, Dunbar's effects. Um, and, and I think we're still learning, you know, still very early, like what is the optimal circle size? Um, you know, what teams should be are most informed to make decisions about the value being added by others? Um, I think probably the bigger group you get will find is like the, 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 the quality of sort of the, um, the insight that people have maybe goes down. Um, in, in larger circles, for example, we see a lot like, you know, you can sort of group out how teams are essentially all giving to each other. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes too. Um, and, and ideally, hopefully, using tools like SourceCred and Coordinate increase the, the trust in these larger, you know, more diffuse uh, groups. So how within your system are past contributions rewarded? Can that happen or is it all based upon a you know, particular epoch or time frame that's set? It's users define the, the epoch that they, want to, um, that they want to allocate over. So um, it, 
we definitely have had groups that said, okay, we've been doing, you know, this project. Um, we've been working in this DAO for X amount of months and sort of do one coordinate epoch for contributions up to this point, right? So sort of like a, a, a comprehensive, like if I think back over the, the last X amount of time and think about all the things you've done to get us here um, and then, you know, allocate that way and then sort of get into more of a cadence. Um, a lot of people use, you know, a biweekly or monthly cadence to do their allocations. But, but it's definitely been used that way to do sort of retroactive. Yeah, I find the retroactive thing particularly interesting because, I mean, particularly with the source cred algorithm, if someone's created a core piece of code that's still being used or even something that was created a long time ago but didn't get picked up and gets picked up two years down the track... Um, and then suddenly it's being used a lot and that person is earning cred for that or being recognised is another way of putting it, uh, and they've long since left that community. Um, it's an interesting dynamic, certainly not something you would see in a regular work context. I think academics kind of do it through citations where... It would be impossible. I mean, our, our universities were always trying to rate us on an annual basis, but of course, you might come up with a discovery that doesn't, that's not important until after you've retired. Um, so, should we therefore not do those important fundamental discoveries and just go for the thing that's going to get recognized now? <laughs> Uh, so I think academics experience the hardship of this in a different way. Um, but yeah, so I, I think for me, I've been fascinated by some of those dynamics around past contrib contributions and, and I suppose how people feel about that because there's something very temporal about com online communities. Um, if I look at, and I can see because of SourceCred's system, their algorithm, how long people have been involved and many of the current people that are maintaining this code base are, are reasonably new. Um, they're not the original people necessarily. And in fact, the founder very consciously stepped out recently um, and, and, and did that kind of handover, like I'm officially gone now type of thing. So there's, the, and that to me um, is, 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 not, is a good thing that you can have renewal in these communities. Uh, but where does, where does the organisational memory go in these places? Perhaps some of these tools are also a way of retaining some of that organisational memory too. I mean, it, it, it is interesting that it, it, it relies on, you know, the memory of, of, of whoever happens to be there. Um, I think, you know, a lot of us, this, this reminds me of the, like, oh, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially the ones that we don't know about. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, really, it's a really intriguing idea of how can you actually get credit um, due to the people who are actually making the contribution. Um, I think especially, you know, when you talk about that, to me it brings up like an equity lens, right? And, and how, can we, how can we make sure that everyone is actually being... Um, you know, evaluated and allocated based on, on their actual contribution and not, um, you know, there's a history, obviously, of, of men getting all of the credit and, you know, um, and reward for ideas that were not theirs. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of that. And so that's, that's a hope of Web3 is how we think about these systems for decentralized rewarding um, are also a way to, you know, maybe start to to dismantle some of these larger patterns, you know, of 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 various forms of oppression and, and patriarchy and whatnot. Yeah, which which does also raise the extent to which these tools may become useful in governance in terms of um, showing what's been done and what is valued that I suppose our human biases can not easily compute all the time. I, like I'm thinking, for instance, of some of the delegation uh, governance systems we've seen lately where 
people who are really good at Twitter seem to end up as delegates, <laughs> which having been on boards is not necessarily like how I would do it. Um, there would be a, a skills matrix and diversity criteria and all of mm-hmm. these other things. Um, right. And I'm not saying that these kinds of tools that we're talking about today will necessarily resolve that issue, um, but um, at, at least you, we have now some kind of record of what's been valued and who has done what, which can start those conversations. Yeah, I think the conversation itself is just, you know, what's important. I mean, we're, we're operating in at least a frame of transparency, you know, and if not perfect transparency, certainly like a, a, a radical leap in transparency from what most people have experienced in pyramid-shaped organizations, right, where most of the decisions that are happening, you have no idea you know, who's really who's making them or really why they're being made or the rationale behind them. Um, it's, it's very hard to get into these limited, you know, roles and rooms and whatnot. Um, and it's a fundamentally different paradigm when we're asking, you know, everybody, um, you know, who, who deserves credit, cred for this, you know, who, sh- who should get paid, who's adding value. Um, it's sort of a, a it's, it's a massive shift and it's, it's certainly not perfect. Um, you know, I'm, I think we're all, I'll speak for myself. I can get a little, a little giddily naive about, you know, the future that the potential of DAOs like shows is possible, the kinds of collaboration at scale to actually be able to, you know, address some of these, um, you know, global crisis level problems that we're facing. Um, and it is encouraging that there is like a, a fundamentally different paradigm going on, um, in moving from sort of a, a, a pyramid structure to a spherical one um, as sort of our organizing, organizing criteria for how, to, how do communities work. Um, you know, just the fact that DAOs are owned ostensibly by the people that are adding value to them is, is totally radical and moves these sort of, you know, co-op, kind of the niche co-op um, world into like the primary organizing um, organizing structure and that is is hugely exciting and I also agree that being good at Twitter is like one of the most asymmetric skill sets apparently <laughs> being good at Twitter especially crypto Twitter seems to have all sorts of benefits I just wanted to quickly jump in with the question of when kind of alluding to that aspect of, you know, as, as you were just kind of mentioning, shifting from the pyramid to more of the sphere and, and making that kind of transition and thinking about decentralization and how it affects culture, how it affects compensation. In terms of just the way both of you individually consider the landscape of problems right now, how much are they interpersonal problems that just, you know, we're using better tools to surface what the problems are, and then it's a whole separate set of questions how we deal with the interpersonal aspects of how do we just human better together, or how much of it is still sort of on the side of what are the mechanisms around being able to perform this? Is it a question of, well, how frequently do I get paid? Does that need to be standardized across circles to be bi-weekly? So that, it re- you know, or is it kind of the actual delivery of how people interact with these systems and the specific uh, aspects of thinking through those details that can replicate job security and comfort and, you know, provide people that comfortable work environment uh, so that they, they do feel like they can do the best work and commit to building that trust because that takes time in an environment as well. And I know there have been some in, you know, some communities where we had a separate discussion about onboarding, right? The whole question of how do you think about culture through the prism of onboarding and when do you start building that? Because it just takes time to build that trust. So yeah, long-winded question to say, do you see more of the interpersonal or more the, the, the actual mechanisms or forms of how you interact with people as kind of the, the areas you just find yourself more concerned about these days and, and think about more? The interpersonal is everything. Like, it doesn't, you know, at the end of every tool is, is a person. And, you know, the say, like, what is that? No, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Like, no, no system survives contact with the actual people that are going to use it, right? People are messy, irrational, emotional, social beings. Um, and so, I mean, I think this is... Uh, is particularly relevant because we hear this all the time. You know, people have feature ideas for coordinate or saying like, 
you know, we want to turn off the transparency of the map because, you know, people are giving to people because they feel bad they didn't get enough give, not because they actually did anything useful. And it's like, well, that's, that's not a tool function, right? <laughs> that's, that's a conversation. Um, and I would say, like, you know, at least 50% of the, the feature requests that we get are people saying, there should be a feature so that I don't have to have this hard conversation with the people I'm working with. Um, and so, you know, I think that that, that is, is certainly as we move more, you know, remote and asynchronous, like the interpersonal stuff is going to be increasingly critical and there'll be an array of amazing tools and there'll still be people at the end of them trying to figure out how to, how to get along and collaborate. Like Zach and I think many other people working in this area, I have a history in community organizations, um, spent many years in the community radio sector here in Australia and went to a school which was a bit commune-like. <laughs> so, and, and I think those of us who have had those experiences are very familiar with when communities become insular and break down and we, it, when you haven't experienced that, you can easily idealise communities and um, there's been a lot of great feminist writing, in fact, on the problems of community uh, and the politics of difference and all of those types of things, um, which I think are very, very relevant to the experiences of DAOs and Web3 in general. Uh, but what we have and what we're doing differently is trying to find some level of automation that can... Um, it will never ever rule out interpersonal dynamics, but it might um, diffuse them or background some processes. And sometimes that's going to not work very well. I mean, one example, I suppose, is auto moderator in Reddit, which infamously um, hides your posts but if you're a new person for a month to make sure that you're not spamming or a bot or something like that. Um, and, you know, so then you get a whole lot of people who are new to Reddit saying, why, why isn't anyone responding? Because they can't even see that they've been uh, made invisible. So, you know, and I'm sure that there's going to be all of those kinds of problems arising through these new tools as well. Uh, but the fact is we live in a intermediated digital world, particularly in the case of DAOs, where the experiences and challenges and ways of communicating that we have are um, online and have vulnerabilities because of that as well. So things like civil attacks or whatever it might be, you get, you get new problems in these places which do require responses and tools to deal with them. Uh, so we, that's where we're at. And it's about how we live with these bots and tools and how we make them suitable for the kinds of challenges that we face. And that, to me, is the fascinating point that we're at right now in Web3 and over the last six months in particular, where the conversations around that are starting to happen in a very serious way. And it's moving out of, say, everyone should just have a universal basic income. And in some respects, you know, that... I think perhaps what you've just described there, Zach, where people are giving to someone because it looked like they didn't have enough, is perhaps part of that human desire to make sure that everyone has something, and that's good. <laughs> and you're right, I don't think we should be stopping that dynamic. And like we see in SourceCred that there are people who will say, no, I'm not going to claim my grain this time around because I don't need it. Mm -hmm. And I'd prefer it to go to the treasury so that other people get a better payout. So you do start to see a kind of care for the community and for each other, which is a really um, valuable thing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely, um, we, it's, it's, it's interesting, actually, several groups, including ourselves at Coordinate, um, have now created, we have our own sort of internal UBI. So every, everyone that's a core contributor gets X amount of set, set compensation every month. Um, and then 
sort of we take market rate compensation and whatever is above that UBI, we put into a big pool to be distributed via the coordinate mechanism, via community allocation. Um, so the idea that everyone has a baseline can help reduce some of that, um, like, well, man, I don't want to leave them with anything. I also don't want to, like, slowly create a free rider culture where, you know, the, somebody who's not contributing that much still gets uh, an allocation because people feel bad for them. Um, because, you know, that's not what we're trying to, to create. And really, you know, the, the ultimate expression of a DAO is a, a full harnessing of collective intelligence. And the DAO sort of itself, as conjured by its members, has some some will that it's trying to carry out. And so, you know, you, the, the purpose of the culture is to support the DAO in its purpose. Um, and, and a purpose isn't supported by people that, that aren't helping taking resources. Um, and so, you know, there's sort of this like, uh, there's always these trade-offs, you know, and they're dynamic tensions. It's not a problem. You know, like, well, what are you going to do? Reward free riders or be cutthroat? And just like, no, you have to, <laughs> it's value only. It's like, well, it's always going to be, you know, some mix and navigation of it um, and how you set that culture. But we have, and other groups have sort of created internal UBIs as part of Coordinate um, to reduce some of that sort of friction. I'm curious as to how you take leave. If you want to go on holiday or you... Um, are not well, or you've got some family issues going on, is, is there just a standard procedure for that? Or you, you tell each other, or how does it work? Because I yeah. find that taking time out and still having some kind of salary is an important thing too. Yeah, that, I mean, it's, um, yeah, people can leave, can leave whenever they want to do whatever they want. Um, you know, obviously, we're we're trying to attract community members who are aware of their you know they're balancing their self and shared interests, so they're understanding that if there's a their key, you know, if they're a key contributor in some you know project flow, and they're not just like, hey, I'm leaving for a week, you know, this is that there's some there's some way to make sure that work continues to flow and gets things done. Um, I think it's kind of basic you know communication skills, and and right now it's still small enough you know, our, our core group to where we can just say, hey, you know, I'm going to be gone Wednesday. I'm going to be out Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'll get back to this stuff whenever. Um, yeah, as a community gets bigger, you know, there's, there's obviously different ways that, that you can go about doing that. But I, I think that it's also, it, it's, you know, you could look at it one way and say, well, if you don't, if you're not working, then you're not getting paid. You know, this is, this is a problem. You could also look at it as a totally liberating thing. And if I say, you know what, I'm taking two weeks off and I don't have to worry that I'm burdening somehow the community, you know, or am I really earning, earning my pay or now I can't take any more time off ever because I've already taken my two weeks. It's like, no, if you don't contribute anything, you won't get paid anything, it's fine. Um, you know, it, it, it allows a lot more freedom to come and go. And if somebody says... I just got this opportunity to do this awesome project over here. Like, I'm going to tie up these loose ends and I'm gone for a month. It's like, oh, okay, like, that's a bummer. Like, look forward to have you coming back, but also awesome for you. Like, go ahead and do it. There's no negotiations around, you know, well, how long is your leave and what are we going to do with this much pay and um, what about your benefit? It's like, no, everything is very, it becomes very, very fluid. It coordinate, just to, to sort of build on that point, like, there's, you know, this in this paradigm is sort of the end of hiring and firing. Um, you no longer have to go through this process of, you know, here's what I'm going to do. Well, are you going to do this? Okay, we make an agreement and then lock our both ourselves into this imagined future as opposed to why don't you just come start working and we'll start paying you and then <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, you know, it, it, it makes a, a tremendous amount more sense. I love that idea that um, we don't have to apply for jobs in the same way anymore. We um, join a community and see how it goes and whether it's a good fit or not becomes apparent through just 
normal forces. When that happens and someone joins and then they, it's not a good fit, do they just disappear? Is that generally what happens or they just don't get that involved? You know, it tends to be that someone, sh and I've only had this experience, to be honest, like once um, so far in, in this whole endeavor, but I'm sure there's lots of anecdotal stories out there. But someone comes with a lot of enthusiasm and ideas on what's going to add value to the community and they start doing it. Right? And then when the community allocates, they don't get nearly as big as allocation as they thought. Um, and they're essentially saying like, yeah, look, like I wrote, look at all this stuff I wrote and look at all this stuff I published and that I did. And it's like, yeah, but, but we're rewarding value, not, not product. You know, <laughs> it's like no one in the community thought that this writing was, was adding that much value. Um, and, you know, they were sort of like they had a different opinion about what the value was. And so they bounced out. Um, you know, some people might come in and do the same thing, make a bunch of stuff and say, hey, this is so cool. Look, I'm going to help. And then people are like, ah, like, you know, what would have been cooler is like if you did this and then they stick around and do it. And like, great. Now they've, you've got a feedback loop going for them of what's valuable and for the community, you know, of what's valuable. Um, you know, it's also, I, I think it, it creates a lot more possibilities, you know, if, um, if I go up to, you know, the CEO of my company, I say, I have this crazy outrageous idea that I want to do, and I don't know if it'll work. It's like, no, and you're not approved and you can't get the budget and this isn't. Whereas if someone in a DAO has a crazy idea that they want to try, they can just rock up and do it. And, you know, if, if someone says, like, I want to try this, it's like, no, that's terrible, it'll never work, versus I did this, it's, it's just an entirely different conversation. And, the, and that you can say, like, wow, you're compensated for that. Um, I, I think it just, you know, it rewards a certain kind of, of entrepreneurial or risk-taking, um, you know, person that, that can actually, you know, that becomes, like, discerning what's valuable in a community and then producing it um, is, I think, you know, an incredible skill to start honing for the 21st century. Um, and so hopefully, you know, tools like source grid and coordinate help facilitate that. Um, I don't, I don't need to wait to, for permission from anybody to start adding, adding what I think is valuable. And then I get that immediate feedback loop from the community and what is valuable. Do you think that some kinds of work get rewarded over others unfairly? You know, I don't know. I, I, think, I, I think the only real answer to that is that is each community kind of has to de determine that. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's really hard. It's so context dependent, right? I mean, whoever made the 3-3 three, three meme for Ohm added arguably as much value as 10 coders who actually built the thing, right? Um, and you could make the exact same argument, vice versa. Say, we actually made the whole thing. All you did is made this, like, little meme. You know, which, which one was more valuable? And that's what I think is beautiful. It's up for the community to sort of really figure this out. Um, and there's other, you know, kind of customizations that things that people have done to give certain people, for example, larger allocations of give. So, um, you know, if, if someone is, is kind of running the tech team and there's a lot of engineers that are working more solo or just like kind of running on a project hard that don't have as much exposure and people don't understand, you know, all these inner workings, it's probably more important that they get a disproportional amount of award. Um, you know, there's, there's different ways to sort of think of it that way. It doesn't always have to be even. We're very, we're very into hierarchies. <laughs> um, I, I super am supportive of hierarchies, which, which I think get a bad rap in Web3. Um, but I think a lot of, and this is actually something I'm excited about, is a lot of the, you know, skills like, like community curation, you know, weaving, um, onboarding, checking in, culture creation, you know, a lot of these things, it's very hard, um, you know, even when, when at Coordinate, when we're talking about, um, you know, what did you do this week, right? Well, I shipped three PRs. What did you do? Oh, well, I was on a, a scurf. Uh, interview podcast like okay like how much value does that have um, it's it, it depends right it's really subjective for people to try and understand 
Um, so yes, you know, different work gets rewarded in all sorts of different ways, and it depends on sort of the culture and also on the conversations we're having, again, about, about what is valuable. I think Eugene and I are now feeling the pressure to make this a good podcast so that you get some reward <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah, it's in a whole new dimension to socializing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I ask is, you know, early on when I first started getting interested in blockchains and I was going back to, gosh, 2016, 2017, I started looking at Decred because it was one of the early communities that was, you know, doing something like a DAO and uh, had a treasury where you could apply to do something like marketing and people would have to vote on whether to fund that activity Richard Redd has written a lot about this, so he actually has kind of picked up, uh, f you know, documenting that journey for SourceCred and done a, uh, sorry, for um, Decred, all these creds, and done a really good job of it. But um, I, uh, yeah, but I mean, I suppose what I'm trying to get at here is there's, it's a very different method to where, you know, the, the treasury voting model, where you apply to do something and you have a ton of developers involved in that thing who think that coding is the most important thing in the world, uh, whereas someone who make memes, um, as you point out, um, might not be able to get reward or even get commissioned in this case. Whereas if it's more that I'm re rewarding you retrospectively for what you've done, you can see that the 3-3 meme has worked in that particular example. And even maybe some of those developers would be inclined to throw some uh, rewards in that direction. So it, it possibly, I don't know, I don't have any evidence of this, but it would seem to me that maybe you get more diversity of outcomes as a result. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I certainly, you know, I, this is one of the reasons we're a huge advocate for, you know, the kind of the original use case of coordinate was community circles. Um, and it was at Yearn, you know, where you have all sorts of community contributors coming and doing things. And there was a small committee that was in charge of grants, you know, and they would get 20 grant applications in a month. And someone was saying, you know, I want $3,000 because I translated everything into Russian. And another person was saying, you know, I want $4,000 because I'm moderating the Discord. And and there's another person who they know is doing tons of stuff who didn't even ask for a grant. <laughs> um, and so, like, how do you make these apples to oranges comparisons? And, and also, like, why are we the ones deciding this? Like, whoever voted us to be the grant committee, <laughs> this just sort of happened, right? So that was really the tension that, that Coordinate was designed around. It's like, let's just push the decision making out and, and let the community decide how we should allocate this, this this grant money. Um, as we've done the same thing at Coordinate, you know, this somebody, Lloyd Banksy, showed up in our, in our Discord and started making all these memes. And it's like, oh, these are great. You know, if someone had said, I propose, you know, I want you to allocate this much money and I will make this many memes, it's like, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, like, I'm not gonna vote for that. I wanna see the memes first. As opposed to he made them and then you're like, oh, this is great. You know, he's in the community circle now. And we have budget sort of allocated for the community circle every month so that, you know, it's essentially like an R&D from the community. Like, come try this stuff. Do stuff. Help out. There's, there's reward there. If, if you consistently keep adding value in this, in this sort of bigger community circle layer, what's going to happen eventually? Right? They're going to say, like, hey, why don't you come do a lot more of this? Um, and so... Yeah, it, it, I think it creates a much bigger diversity and a much faster um, feedback loop and turnaround time as, a, as, as concerning what's valuable. Um, and it also increases innovation because, you know, my preconceived idea about what's valuable is obviously going to have tons of blind spots um, that someone needs a chance to come, come ex expose. And then finally, it creates a doer. You know, and this is really important, this sort of doer mentality. So that, it, you know, instead of like, well, pay me to do something and then, I'll, and then I'll make it, as opposed to someone that's saying, 
hey, I'm excited about this stuff. I've got some ideas. Like, check it out. I did it. What do you think? Like, that's, that, that is so crucial for DAOs. Um, you know, there's every DAO has lots of people showing up at the Discord saying, what do I do? How can I help? Where do I get involved? Um, and every DAO has a few people who also show up and be like, I'm excited about this. I have some skills to offer here. Here's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing. It's interesting. I, I came across an advert. I think it was for Rye DAO manager recently, a job advert. And my goodness, that was a humongous role. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of, oh, yeah, they were going to pay 100 grand a year or something like it. They were definitely going to reward it well. Um, but it was kind of confronting almost to see it spelled out in a regular mm. job advert what work goes on in a DAO. <laughs> so, and if you can distribute that work, you know, that's a different, a different situation and really what you're talking about. Um, yeah. And, but well, I, I did well, wonder you, how on earth are they going to fill that position? <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's interesting. And this draws on, you know, the converge work um, because we had these, these networks um, running for, for various, you know, stewarding 500,000 acres of redwoods or um, defending migrant rights across borders, across Central America and Mexico, right? And these are groups of 60 and 70 people that, that all are working sort of in, in one part of this much larger effort. And the network coordinator role is, is hypercritical. Um, and there were lots of different metaphors we used to describe it. I like sort of an air traffic control, I think is very apt, right? You're not actually doing the work, but you are helping the work to get done um, and creating that cohesion and culture. I think, you know, gardener, symphony conductor, there's a lot of different metaphors for what that role is doing. Um, but it's, it's fundamentally about information coming in and curating that and then sending the information back out, but especially also facilitating that information across. Um, and that's really the, the secret sauce of DAOs. You know, it's not, it's not kind of the core people hosting a town hall and telling you what's going on and hearing from the community. It's them being able to say, oh, Ellie, you're into that. You should talk to Eugene because he's been working on this other thing. You know, it's that sort of linking and weaving the community together, um, which is, is hypercritical and is in some ways like the toughest thing to train. You know, there's some people who are just menches um, who are, are into that and track that. You know, um, and and I think it's going to be an increasingly, increasingly hyper hyper uh, important role in in these DAOs as they proliferate. I just wanted to uh, jump in and ask, uh, especially as we're getting close to time and recognizing that we we unfortunately have to wrap up shortly. I kind of want to think about the element because we've already talked a little bit about how. Uh, there's the interpersonal change that's at the back of any tool, right? It, it's not just specific to crypto, Web3, DAOs, etc. But there's also this element of, uh, for folks who are now designing tools, they have to be aware of as people start using it, there's that feedback loop that's developed that can hopefully enforce and reinforce culture over time. So I guess from, from your perspective, uh, what do you see as sort of if you had to start building a new system tomorrow, right? Whether it's a new protocol, reward system, whatever, like you, you were just tasked with having to build a new community from scratch. What would be the kind of things you're thinking about and keeping top of mind, recognizing the power of that loop? Because I don't think that's something that's, at least I know in speaking to folks who I know in CS or engineering, that loop isn't always reinforced as a top priority as you're thinking about how your design requirements meet human beings, meet something beyond that. And so, yeah, I was just wondering and uh, kind of, yeah, using this as a, as a segue towards the end here of just in general, how, how powerful you see that loop is and the way to think about some aspects around it. I'll say something which is pretty basic and uh, I'm sure Zach has a more sophisticated answer, but for me, purely from an ethnographic point of view as someone observing what goes on, uh, channels or systems for gratitude and attention and appreciation are really important if you want to make these systems work. And also I would say these are the things that 
will be transformative in the long run because they change how we behave towards each other and they enhance specific values and um, ways of uh, working and being in the world. So if that's an algorithm that's causing us to do that, I'm fine with it if we all just in the end be better to each other. I have to say, like, that, that is the, um, if I was going to start building another tool, it would look a lot like Coordinate um, for, the, for the reason Ellie just said. You know, I think at the very base of Maslow's pyramid is some version of, you know, seeing and being seen. Like, people's actual biggest need is they want to, they want to give their gifts or give their talents and, and, and help and, and add value and then be be seen and rewarded and acknowledged for it and be appreciated. Um, this is sort of the, the core human need. And so um, creating systems that facilitate that, um, that, that are, are diverse enough to where all of people's different gifts and points of view and you know, ways of being uh, have, have a, a welcome place somewhere, right? That they can sort of find their way into something and find a way to contribute in that thing that's bigger than themselves and then be seen and rewarded and thanked for it. And, and compensation, obviously, is a, is a huge part of that. Um, but not just compensation. Uh, you know, we'll, if, if we had more time, we could get all into extrinsic and, and intrinsic motivation and, and how there, there are certain kinds of problems that offering more money makes you worse at solving, not better. Um, and they're most of the important ones, the creative ones. And so... Um, yeah, I, I think that as we think about these tools, you know, start from, from really thinking about like what, what are ways of being and cultures that we really want to support and, 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 and let flourish. Um, it's been fascinating to me, you know, I, in this Web3 world, which I am, you know, came to in about a year ago um, with, with no computer science experience and I've never written any code and seeing, you know, this, this, industry that has such deep roots, you know, in deep code and engineering and crypto and, and, and crypto's whole sort of worldview is like safety against attack vectors, right? It needs to be totally permissionless and trustless and sort of completely adversarial. Um, and now this layer that's being built on top of it, you know, is, is a much different mindset. Um, it's much more humanistic and, and it's like, actually, we don't need to make all of these, all of these, um, you know, fail safes and protections in, in, in DAOs because DAOs are largely collaborative, trustful environments. You know, one of the, one of the questions we get all the time on coordinate is, well, how do you prevent collusion? You know, people could just talk to each other and decide to get, give their give to each other. Um, there's, there's actually very little, you know, material reward for doing that. It's, it's, it's not that advantageous and, and it'll be quickly found out and you'll kind of burn all your social cred for like a few extra bucks one month. But it, 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 we haven't seen it happen almost at all, right? Like people are, are not consciously gaming things like this. Like most people are part of a DAO because they want to contribute and they want to be acknowledged for it. Um, so I, I think you know, this, this next layer, it's going to be really fascinating to see the space evolve as it sort of grows out of its hardcore engineering roots and hopefully includes that, obviously, as it transcends into more, more um, you know, including humanistic tendencies and, and, and humanistic perspectives as well. Well, great. Thank you so much. That's such a, a wonderfully hopeful and positive note to end on. I definitely hope that that is the future that that, that is in store for us uh, and appreciate both the research and work both of you are doing to at least try to contribute and nudge us in that direction as much as possible. So yeah, thank you both for taking the time to chat with us today. And yeah, we look forward to our future conversations.